Good morning and welcome to worship at St. Patrick. This is the third Sunday in the Easter tide season. We're so glad to be here celebrating the resurrection with you. And uh, got just a handful of announcements, all really directed toward our youth and youth parents. So uh, if you are not a youth or a youth parent, make sure you're paying extra special attention so you know how to pray for everybody that actually is affected by these things. So Field of Friends kickball is tonight, and the youth group is helping out. So uh, 4 o'clock will be the the middle school youth group helping out. Arrive at 4, pick up at 7 as per usual. So you'll help out with uh, the kickball and then have your your dinner. Now, I happen to know what you're having for dinner tonight, and I'm afraid to say what it is because I don't want a run on everything uh, because it's already purchased. But I will say that Jim Holland is providing dinner tonight, so make sure that you are here. Senior Recognition Sunday, if you uh, have or are a senior, I hope that you have uh, spoken with Amy about that. Uh, We want to honor our seniors. Uh, Now, to be clear, these are youth announcements, and so these are seniors in high school, uh, not those who are, what I don't know what the appropriate age is anymore, so I'm not going to say it. If you identify as a senior, Uh, make sure that it's about high school. So uh, that is going to be on May 7th. We want to celebrate them very well. Uh, Also, we have a youth tacky prom coming up next weekend uh, from 6 to 8.30 on April 30th. That is Sunday night. It's the final youth group event of the year. You just go down to Goodwill and pick out something ridiculous. Uh, I loved Luke's joke last week. Um, If you don't know what tacky is, ask your parents what they wore Uh, to their prom. So if that's offensive to you, that was Luke and he's new and we're working with him. Uh, Also, there is only one week left to sign up for our summer trips at normal price. So uh, that is uh, The Edge, that's RYM. Um, It's going to be fantastic. A lot of kids have already signed up, but we want a lot more. We want to absolutely run the place with St. Patrick Pride. So make sure uh, that you sign up before May 1st so that uh, you get that discount. And that's it for announcements this morning. Let's take a few moments and prepare our hearts for worship. Let us pray. Almighty God, who through your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, overcame death and opened to us the gate of everlasting life, grant that we who celebrate with joy the day of the Lord's resurrection may be raised from the death of sin by your life-giving Spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Would you stand as we sing? Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. My soul praise him for he is thy health and salvation. All ye who hear, now to his temple draw near and join me in glad adoration. Praise to the Lord over all things so wondrously.
death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Join us in singing. Now the days and hours and moments of our suffering seem so long And the toilsome wait and wandering threaten silence to our song Now our pain is real and pressing Where our faith is thin and weak but our hope is set on Jesus, and we cling to Him our strength. Oh, eternal weight and glory, oh, inheritance divine, we will see our Lord Scars of Christ our Lord, we will see the weight of glory and our broken years restored. For behold, I tell a mystery that the trumpet sound will wake, that the swan. victory songs of grace for behold I tell a mystery that the trumpet sound will wake and death is swallowed up in victory when we meet our king of grace and every year we thought was wasted and every night we Every night we cried how long All will be a passing moment In our Savior's victory song When my word takes me places I don't want to go Christ before me when my heart aches with sorrow as I hit the road Christ 
us. We rejoice at a Trinitarian vision of your fellowship. One God in three persons, mutually indwelling one another in harmonious self-giving, which spills out into all creation and gives shape to all other thriving. Your loving unity is the fount of every blessing. As we gather to turn our eyes upon you this morning, to receive your gifts through word, sacrament, and prayer, we ask that you would captivate us with the communal nature of thriving, that mankind is made in the image of a we. We sense this in our best relationships, in their best moments, that we were made not only from intimacy, but for it. Yet the depth of truth, goodness, and beauty in communal harmony make it all the more painful for us to endure the disunity, the pain, the violence that we also experience, often in greater measure in our everyday lives. It often feels easier to go on protecting ourselves from relational vulnerability in this world, which because of sin is an unsafe place. Because we are designed for intimacy, we have a great need to let our guards down. And yet we've been harmed. And because we can only give what we have received, we have also caused harm. We're indebted and enslaved to wounds that we bear and return over and over again. And because we only have one heart, these walls that we've built up against suffering have also become barriers to our flourishing. Lord, have mercy on us. We are incapable of love. 
But we thank you, Lord, that in view of this, you've continued to be the same loving, communal, generous God you've always been. You continue to give, and not mere gifts, but you give your very self. By his crucifixion, we are released from bondage. By his wounds, we are healed. By his resurrection, we have hope for newness in the relationship we once pronounced dead to us. Freedom from resentment and bitterness, codependency and control. Whom the Spirit has set free is free indeed, and we will free others. So help us this day to forgive those who have sinned against us, to forbear those with whom harmony is simply difficult for us. Make your church a sign and a symbol to all mankind, especially in the midst of an ever-widening polarity of factions of what is truly oneness in many. Hear our cry as it echoes your sons that you would make us one as you are one. And may the unison of our voices be a foretaste and offering in earnest as we pray the way Christ taught us, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, As you're being seated, the ushers are going to come past your rows and they're going to pass these plates that are uh, both an opportunity but also a sign of what it means to be generous. As I was preparing this weekend for our book club discussion on the Dawn Treader, I was amazed at one of the main themes being the brokenness of our relationship with wealth with giving, with generosity in general. And it was such a mirror to our own lives, I think. Uh, The church provides us with an opportunity to be healed in our relationship to giving. And so this is an opportunity for us to not only to give, but also to consider our relationship to giving with a generous God. So hear now and receive this song. Testifies to these things. Surely I am coming soon. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, come. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be. Grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Come. Come, Lord Jesus. Come.
you stand as we confess together this articulation of our faith, these borrowed words like a song give us an expression that we wouldn't be able to come up with on our own. And yet this is our faith. This is who we are. So Christians, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day, He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, He will come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, again, welcome to St. Patrick. We're so glad to have you in worship with us. It's always our desire to embody Christ in the everyday as we make disciples who love God, love people, and love life. Uh, the best way we know how to do that is to get into smaller families on mission, which we call community groups. If you're not part of a community group yet, you're missing out, I guarantee you, on 95% of what it means to be a part of St. Patrick. And so uh, we still have some time in the semester for you to dip in, uh, visit a couple of groups, see what that's all about. We would love to have you. If you have any questions about that, come see me at the Connect table just outside in the narthex to your right. I would love to connect connect you to uh, an extended family formed and shaped by and for the gospel. Uh, would you now turn and greet one another in the name of the Lord? Okay, if you have a Bible, you can turn to Acts 22, but before we do that, just a word of personal privilege. Uh, Friday night, I, I went uh, into East Memphis at what's called the Joy Prom. Okay, you've heard about that a lot, but you had not seen what it looks like. 
Uh, put the other one up first. There you go. This is what Joy Prime looks like. 200 kids, special needs, being celebrated. The best Motown band I've ever heard. People dancing for three hours. Matt looking stoical. And uh, this happened. These kids are grace like this because of a big investment. I sculptured, you see that? Because of a big investment, a couple of things are happening here. Uh, Josh was talking about families on mission. First of all, you, you invest in people through communities. And that's not near all the people. When I walked in the room for the first time, I was back as a pastor uh, to people. 80% of people that have special needs kids do not go to church. And we know statistically a lot of them will be divorced. And so here's a lot of people laying down their life. And so they're doing this together, okay? So they're doing this. is not one-off. We do one-off mission here. No, these are people uh, doing life, not just feasting together, but ministering together. And when I walked into the room, I went to every station. It was just St. Patrick people. And these, these are people from all over Memphis. And uh, so uh, it was just a, a, real, a real big deal. And so I, I just want to celebrate that. Thank y'all, because we've put an investment. I mean, money it takes money to do this. We invested in another staff member, and uh, because we did this, uh, you kind of see this kind of magic, and it'll happen this afternoon as well. So anyway, on to the text. So we're in Acts chapter 22. Uh, we're in the last part of Acts, okay? If you do the math. Uh, you can see we're at the end. Uh, and so it's interesting how Luke arranges this. Because obviously the first half, we see Paul the way we want to see anybody. He's at the top of his game. He is a boss. He is strategic. He's calculated. He's courageous and caring. He's carefully crafted his uh, ministry uh, with intentionality uh, so that he would strategically plant churches that would plant churches in other places in the Gentile world. And he is a Jedi. Well, for the last three weeks, we've seen Paul's life take a different turn. And Luke is going to record this just as accurately as when Luke is in control, when he can give the lecture on what it means to plant churches. And what's so interesting is he goes to Jerusalem just to do the next right thing. He, he is so passionate that the Jewish people, all the promises have come through the Jews. And now they've exploded to the Gentile, these oshed, unwashed outsiders, and they're coming in on equal footing. And, and this is hard for the Jewish people to swallow culturally. Uh, and, he, and so he's bringing money back. Uh, he even says uh, in Romans, most interesting thing, he said, the Gentiles are indebted to you because they're heirs of the promise. See that? In other words, they're going to give you physical tokens of their affection because you have blessed them with the heritage that they didn't earn or ethnically could have never been a part of. So he goes back and immediately uh, finds himself... Uh, uh, in, in a bad place. I mean, he's going an extra mile to his ethnic people, goes through a purification rite, shaves his head, and uh, this immediately causes a riot that we saw last week, and it's only his savvy in the midst of the riot, claiming a Roman citizenship that keeps him from getting beaten. So, so here is where Paul finds himself. Uh, he is between a Roman power who is the oppressor of his people and basically find their job just to pacify them, keep the riots down, and collect taxes. And between his own people, who he's come home, and they are sworn to kill him. He's between a rock and a hard place. Paul, who has called all his own shots for years, is now bound and captive. He has no control. Where is God? So let's look at the text this morning. We're going to read the first, we're going to work through the whole chapter, but we're going to read the first uh, 10 verses, and then we'll get to the last verses later. So here we go. 
Hear God's word. But on the next day, desiring to know the real reason why he was being accused by the Jews, he unbound him. This is the, the centurion. This is the, the, the Roman council. And command the chief priest and all the council to meet. And he brought Paul down and set him before them. See, the Romans are trying to figure out if this is a civil or a religious matter. Okay? And looking intently at the council, Paul said, so he's before the Roman council and the ruling council, Jerusalem, the Sadducees and Pharisees. Looking intently at the council, Paul said, brothers, I've lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. And the high priest, Ananias, commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you unwashed wall. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law? And yet, contrary to the law, you order me to be struck. Those who stood by said, Would you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest. For it is written, You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Now, when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the others were Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Brothers, I'm a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. It's with respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead that I'm on trial. Now, when he said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees said there were, was no, there were no resurrection, nor angels, nor spirits, but the Pharisees acknowledged them all. Then a great clamor arose, and some of the scribes of the Pharisees' party stood up and contended sharply. We find nothing wrong in this man. What if a spirit and an angel spoke to him? And when the dissension became violent, the tribune, afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down, take him away from among them by force, and bring them into the barracks. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come here as your people, uh, not quite all together. Some of us uh, more disheveled than we would ever readily admit if we were to totally bring our heart. Uh, some of us utterly distracted. Others of us uh, maybe triumphantly so. Uh, Father, we come in here with a vast array of needs, celebrating on the one hand that we are your children and you love us on our best days and our worst days. And on the other hand, we're caught living in time with an identity that's shaped all too often by the world. So, Father, I pray that you would hear us as we look at a place uh, where we find ourselves often between a crack and a hard place. And show us how you meet us in those times. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Nobody has captured this whole, the imagination, uh, this idea of between a rock and a hard place better than Homer. Uh, you remember in the Odyssey when uh, Odysseus is trying to get home with his men. Uh, he gets delayed for 10 years because he forgets to give an offering to Poseidon. The gods are petty like that. Thank God we don't serve the Greek gods. And so he has to navigate his ship through this pass. Uh, and, on the, and he finds it, it's between uh, Scylla and Charybdis. Now, now Scylla is a, they're immortal monsters. She's got six heads and a long neck so that she can, she doesn't move. She just kind of can reach out into your ship and grab a sailor and big teeth. Now, lest you think, oh, that's easy, we'll just go, we'll just skirt this. A bow shot away is Charybdis, this huge water, pall, water, water uh, whirlwind that will actually suck down your whole ship. And so, so, so there he is. So Odysseus makes a pragmatic choice to quickly go by Scylla and lose six men rather than his whole ship. So the whole point of this is sometimes we do find ourselves and often between these kind of impossible decisions in life. What do we do? 
I mean, decisions like this. Our, our children need special help. But we go and in our investigation to find out what human thriving might cost, we realize that only people that are very wealthy can afford that help. Crack in a hard place. Or we, we, we are in a job and we hate, but the money is too good to change. Our relationships are such that we're often put in double bind by people we love who, who threaten us with alienation and force us to choose between one and the other. Or, or, or maybe we see corruption in the workplace, then we know that if we, we do the honorable thing and maybe say something, it will cost us our job. Or, or like Paul, or we find ourselves totally out of control of our life, and on the one hand is your own people who are trying to kill you, and the other people are the Roman oppressors who just want to keep you pacified and collect your taxes. That's what our text is about. So what did Paul do? So by extension, we come to a text like saying, looking at this with just the curiosity because we often find ourselves, what do we do? Are we just victims? This is where Paul finds himself. So let's, let, what we see is Paul is not a victim, though he might look like it. And we see how Paul is, God is ultimately with him just as intensely, just as much, when he is out, you know, talking to the travel agent about where we're going to go and the churches we're going to plant, as when, he, when seemingly he has totally lost all control and is at the hands of uh, an oppressive government. So we're going to look at it like this. We're in the, the perplexity of life's situations. In other words, we just find ourselves in these conundrums. Secondly, the sweetness of God's direction and then the strangeness of God's protection. It's all here. Let's go. The perplexity of life's situation. So first, we, we, we have to acknowledge that we often find ourselves, often through maybe no intention of our own, just the brokenness of the world in situations that are beyond difficult. There seems no way out. This is Paul in verse 30 of chapter 22, the end of the book. Paul has just stepped into it. Uh, Paul is innocent of all charges, yet that very innocent incites the riot or the, the, the mob and what we see in this. The Roman tribute has been called to rescue him from the mob. So they want to see. So their question is, here's the Roman question. Is this a civil matter? Or is this a religious matter? Okay? We, we can't let, and Paul's a Roman citizen, him be adjudicated by the Jewish people if that is the case. And uh, so since he is, but however, because he's a Jew, they say they call in the, uh, the Jewish ruling council, which is Pharisees and Sadducees, to kind of have a pre-trial arraignment, we might say. Good so far. So Paul... When he, everybody is there, makes a seemingly innocent statement as he addresses uh, the council and, and calls them brothers. See, he's identifying with his own people, okay? Brothers, he's Jewish, he's a Pharisee. And he says this, I've lived my life in all good conscience up to this day. Kind of like, why are we even doing this? Now, the Ananias, the high priest, is not the one that you want to be at the head of the prosecution. Ananias was such an unsavory character that the historian Josephus said of him, he was a great hoarder up of money and even took away the tithes that belonged to the priest by violence. And yet that who is going to hear Paul. Which brings up this violence uh, what brings up this violence is most likely when he says that is, is that, that Paul, though a Christian, still claims to be in solidarity with the Jewish people, a, a Pharisee in good standing. Uh, and then, so Ananias, the high priest, has him struck. Now, this calls out deep anger in Paul, 
righteous anger, and he doesn't pull punches. You can hear it. God's going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. You are setting in judgment of me according to the law, and yet contrary to the law, you have me struck. See, contrary to the law, you're innocent till proven guilty. You're the high priest. You're the hypocrite. You're violating the law of Moses. Now, at this point, one of the others in the Jewish council calls Paul out for disobeying God's law for speaking ill of the high priest. Now, Paul, at this point, quickly repents. It's a sin of omission, at least. I did not know, brothers. Now, whether Paul's been gone long enough, he doesn't know who the high priest is. Maybe dressed in all his accoutrement, you know. You've seen the show, The Chosen. I mean, you know, those things. Dude, I just couldn't do that. I had a guy try to get me to Greek Orthodox one time, and I told him three things. I'm not wearing a dress all day. I'm not wearing a cross this big, and I can't, wear a, I, I can't grow a beard like that. Now, okay, this is at another level. So you would think he could see, but Paul can't see. So we, we don't know why he's in, but he, he does not, he just repents. Now, and this is what I, I love the honesty of Scripture, because the Scripture is not afraid to put, repoint any of its heroes in sin. And, and when you find yourself in places like this, and you find this in marriage, you are rarely innocent. You are rarely innocent. When you're in places like this, their sin is bound to happen, even if you're innocent of all charges. And, and Paul's sin is not that of anger. Anger is good. Anger gets you off dead center. Anger, God's angry. When something you love is threatened, you are angry. That's good. Apparently, though, he doesn't know the high priest. Now, now hear this. Here's what he does in the midst of this. He doesn't blame shift. He doesn't plead mitigating circumstances. He just says, I was wrong. Paul, the most powerful man, stands before and he just owns it. I was wrong. See, see, living in good conscience, is he living in good conscience right now? Because that's what he just said. Is he living in conscience? Do you have to be sinless to live in good conscience? Heavens no. You live in a good conscience as a sinner when you are the chief repenter. In a good conscience doesn't mean sinlessness. Heavens no, that's why Jesus came. Good land. If you could do this, bone your own. Let's just go buy more self-help books. You can't. Sin is going to happen. Even redeemed, sin happens. But it doesn't mean you hide your sin, you own it. Now, now we see Paul's wisdom in this impossible situation. There are two groups of religious leaders here, represented by the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees. And you got to see this. The Sanhedrin are the theological liberals of the day. Okay? So they're in the camp. They're in the camp. They're part of the leaders. They're theological liberals. They, they don't believe in the supernatural, specifically the resurrection of the dead. The Pharisees, who we've learned to hate from Jesus, but yet they are the theological conservatives. They believe in miracles, the resurrection of the dead, the infallibility of Scripture, the coming of Messiah. They just don't believe Jesus was the Messiah. So sizing up the situation... Paul takes Jesus' admonition to heart, be wise as a serpent. And he says this, When Paul perceived that one part were Pharisees, the others the Sadducees, he cried out to the council, Brother, I'm a, I'm a Pharisee, okay? A son of a Pharisee, it was with respect to the hope of the resurrection of the dead that I'm on trial. So he rightly identifies with the Pharisee. In fact, he's really the only true Pharisee here unless Nicodemus was there, because he's not saying anything against the Old Testament. He's just saying Jesus fulfilled it all. He's in, I'm in continuity with everything Jesus did. Jesus fulfilled the Scripture. Jesus fulfilled the law. I am, I am a Pharisee, and he owns it. And because of Jesus, there's a resurrection. Bruce, a commentator, explains why Paul identifies with the Pharisees. 
He said, a, fa a Sadducee could not become a Christian without abandoning the distinctive theological position of his party. A Pharisee could become a Christian and remain a Pharisee. In the early decades of Christianity, at least, it was not until 90 AD or thereabout that steps were taken to exclude Jewish Christians from participating in synagogue worship. When Paul says this, Paul, the Pharisees defend Paul. Genius. You've heard the old saying, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Paul does that one in spades, okay? There is no love lost between the Sadducees and the Pharisees then or now. And the Romans, they get in such an infighting that, that, that this sets in motion them taking Paul away. See, see, Paul's between a crack and a hard spot. He, he's a disciple of Jesus. He speaks the truth. He's angry. He sins. He repents. He's wise. He's walked with Jesus a long time. There's a lot of tools in his belt. He's got scars. He's been through a lot of hard stuff. And he's muddling along, and God is with him in this perplexity. But secondly, we see this, and, 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 and you have to see this. The sweetness of God's direction. Verse 11, this is after this happened. The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage, for as you testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify before me in Rome. Now, even before this, Paul is steady. He has little control, but he's not out of control. He is thinking under pressure. He's wise, but then he gets this from God. Into the midst of this mind-numbing perplexity, being in places he could never have asked to be, never planned to be, in the grips of power greater than him, God gave him comfort. And I'm here to tell you, he will always give you comfort in a dark place. Now, it may take you years to find it because you're so messed up emotionally or psychologically. It might, okay? Trauma, everything else, but it's there. It's there if you can find it. So here it is. How do, how, if we can find out how God comforts Paul when he's between a rock, rock and a hard place, and maybe, and maybe this thing will make us go see help because we can't feel the comfort. We can't attune. We can't get there. So if, if, if we can find out how God comforts Paul, maybe we see how God will give us comfort to navigate the endless complexity of life that there's no chapter and verse for. 98% of the things you face every day when you're in conundrum, there is no chapter and verse. There's wisdom, there's wise counsel, and God has equipped you and give you every resource necessary to handle these. But they're not easy to get at sometimes. So notice what God tells him. Okay, and, and this might not seem to be comfort for most suburbanites. For instance, the last time God spoke to Paul, he told him this, that he would not be attacked or harmed in chapter 18. Here, all he says is he gets the comfort that he will not be killed till he testifies in Rome. Let me break that down for you for a minute because a lot of you say, if I just could hear comfort like that. There are some things we need to hear uh, about the way God is going to send comfort if we can have ears to hear. So, so here's the deal. We're at the sweet spot. If you've been asleep, wake up. If somebody's next to you, wake up. They need to hear this. Okay? If you're planning to go to sleep, you can sleep through the last point. But this is the money ball. Okay? Sometimes there's a money ball. And, and here's the money ball right here. Okay, so to, to most, this would, would, would not be a word of comfort. But to Paul, it's music to his ears. He's only promised he'll be allowed to go to Rome and be an effective witness to the living and dying of Jesus. Okay? So here he is. He's in jail. He, no word that he won't suffer. No word that there's going to be another jailbreak. That's what I'm listening for. 
How are we going to break this thing down? Uh, nothing about getting out of captivity. See, there's no bravado in this. Nothing about security, comfort, or safety. See, it just wouldn't appeal to most of us. He's only promised he'll be allowed to go to Rome. But see, here's why this is comfort. This is Paul's highest joy, his greatest longing. See, th this was smelling sauce to someone who's fainting. This was food for a man who was starving. This was water to someone who had been in the desert. If you're in the soul room this week, you read it. A great passage. I've gone back and read it several times. I said, man, I wish I could get there. I wish, I could get, I wish this was my longing. We're in Philippians. He says, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Jesus Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, so that by any means possible I may obtain the resurrection from the dead." You see that? Paul, Paul is not thinking of himself as a victim. Like, oh, if I could just get out of here, my, the, my ministry effectiveness, I could make all my goals. It's not what Paul's thinking. He is bound but free. He, he is okay with being out of control because God's in control. Paul's a case study in what John Newton said years ago. Thought about this a lot because it, it was, I, I was trying to get here this week, many times. Everything is necessary, he sends. Everything is necessary, God sends. Nothing can be necessary that he withholds. When you're stripped of your idols, can you say that? It is necessary. Paul's thinking that. If he withholds something good, can you say, it is necessary to gain Christ. Or typically, and, and, and it takes a while to get there, typically it's like this, how can God do this to me? Or you say, well, you might say, you might say, because we're, we're trying to dip this, we're trying, we try to dodge this and comfort here because this is hard. We don't want to believe this. Or we dodge it by saying this, well, that was supernatural revelation. God's never given me this. If I was like Paul and got that kind of revelation, I would never fret either. I would ne never sit in isolation. I, I would never disattune. I, I would never disconnect amygdala split, rage and rattle and destroy everybody around me if I was comforted like this. Really? I got good news for you. Because you have the same comfort. Maybe not as specific, but as comprehensive and it covers all the circumstances of life. In Ephesians 1, we read this. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things after the, to the counsel of his will. All circumstances. The circumstances you're in right now, all things. He works them to the counsel, according to the counsel of his will. See, all the circumstances are being influenced by him. They're following him plan. Even the things that seem so evil and unjust, God is capable and does mean to work them towards your good. Everything is necessary, he sends. All things, Paul says, work for the good of those who love him. They will work for your good. The question then becomes, do we trust him? And so, so, so I'm not saying 
I'm not saying it's just an automatic thing. It's, this is no Pollyanna province, promise. You, you may just have an aspiration to get there, but like the trauma in your life is so bad, it will force you to go find it, to find the kind of help. Because you, you may confess to people, and I've told people this many times, after I've talked to them, I said, I can't help you. There's something deeper going on here. You might need some help, and I'll be glad to get you there. I'll take you by my hand. I'm not equipped. But at least, see, there, it, it will push you that way. See, Paul, uh, our, the promise is not as specific at Paul's, but it's every bit as large. And if you can take it in, it'll change your perspective. See, now, and, and it looks something like this. Uh, this is hard uh, when, you, when you're a person of action. And I got some news this week that upset me very greatly. Some just some family kind of stuff, mainly because <laughs> it's going to cost me money. You know, I got my house paid off and other things, and looking forward to that. This and then some news that just might cost me a lot of money. And I was sinking. I was forgetting. I'm trying to attune to this. I'm, I'm, I'm praying myself. I'm, I'm trying to believe that everything that he sends is necessary. Because this can go bad. This can go toxic if I can't get to the promise. That night before he went to sleep, I asked Terry, are you worried? And I'm so thankful for her face. She said, you know, no. God's always made a way. He will this time as well. Everything is necessary that he sends. What a truth. The sweetness of God's comfort. And now the last thing. Okay, quickly. The strangeness of God's protection. Typically, you can't see this till after the fact, but if you just if you hang on to the promise, you'll see it on the other side. The last verse is so this is the rest of the chapter. Okay, I'm gonna read it because it reads like a novel. Okay, it's just good storytelling. When it was day, the Jews made a plot and bound themselves by an oath neither, neither to eat nor drink until they had killed Paul. There were more than 40 who made this conspiracy. They went to the chief priests and elders and said, we have strictly bound ourselves by an oath to taste no food till we have killed Paul. Now therefore, you along with the council give notice to the tribute to, to, tribune to bring him down to us as though you were going to determine his case more exactly. You know, we're going to have round two of this meeting. That The other one ended badly. We've all got our kept our cool, easy peasy. This is a perfect deception. We are, and when you do that, uh, we are ready to kill him before he becomes, he comes near. Now, the son of Paul's sister, this sort of comes out of nowhere. Now, the son of Paul's sister, we didn't even know he had a sister, heard of the ambush, so he went and entered the barracks and told Paul. Paul called one, called one of the centurions and said, take this young man to the tribune, for he has something to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the tribune and said, Paul the prisoner called me and asked me to bring this young man to you as he has something to say to you. The tribune took him by the hand and going aside, asked him privately, what is it you have to tell me? And he said, the Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down to the council tomorrow as though they were going to inquire something more closely about him. But do not be persuaded by them, for more than 40 other men are lying in ambush for him who are bound themselves by an oath, neither to eat or drink till they have killed him. And now they are ready, waiting for your consent. So the tribune dismissed the young man, charging him, tell no one that you have informed me of this, these things. Then he called two of the centurions and said, get ready 200 soldiers with 70 horsemen, 200 spearmen to go as far as uh, Caesarea at the third hour of the night. Also provide mounts for Paul to ride and bring him safely to Felix the governor. And he wrote the letter to this effect. Claudius Lysias. To his excellence, the governor Felix, greetings. This man was seized by the Jews, was about to be killed by them when I came upon him with soldiers and rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman citizen. And desiring to know the charge for which he was being accused, I brought him down to the council and found that he was being accused about questions of their law, but charged with nothing worthy of death or imprisonment. 
And when it was disclosed to me that there would be a plot against the man, I sent him to you at once, ordering his accusers also to state before you what they have against him. So the soldiers, according to their instructions, took Paul and brought him at night to Antipas. And on the next day, they returned to the barracks. So they went halfway, okay? They just got to get them out of town, leading the horsemen to go on with him. When they had come to Caesarea and delivered a letter to the governor, they presented Paul unto him. On reading the letter, he asked what province he was from. And when he learned that he was from Sicilia, he said, I will give you a hearing when your accusers arrive and commanded them to be guarded in Herod's Praetorium. Now, that's a crazy story. The strangeness of God's deliverance. Uh, here, here's, here, 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 here. And so this is an illustration of verse 11. No sooner does Paul get the word of comfort than he hears 40 men have taken an oath to not eat or drink. I wonder if they broke that oath. I just wonder if they're all dead. You never told in the story. Uh, I sort of hope they are. Maybe it's bad. And, and, and so they, they've taken an oath, 40 of them. And yet as William Cooper says in his great hymn, deep in unfathomable minds of ever-ending skill, he treasure up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. Or, or as John Stott says, the most cunning of human plans cannot succeed if God opposes them. And yet there is a strangeness in God's deliverance. It's unfathomable, as it often is. Or maybe it is to show his never-ending skill. Now, if you trace the dot, if one person drops the ball, and essentially maybe none of these are Christians, okay, and everyone is doing what is in his own best self-interest, Tribute certainly is, if you read his letter, I, 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 he's trying, to, he's egomaniacal. We, we don't know much about who the, Paul's nephew. But, but if, not, none of them are on Team Jesus, that's what I'm telling you. Okay, this isn't Team Jesus. This is a bunch of randos. And yet, if one of them doesn't work out, Paul's dead. See, the plotters are undermined. Paul's nephew had to be in on it. They wouldn't have told somebody else, he's in on it. But some compassion, he goes and tells Paul. Paul's nephew has to have courage. I mean, he's in a rock and a hard place. And, and, and it's such a big deal. He said, don't tell anybody about this. I mean, he may be dead next. The commander has to make a wise choice that would lead to Paul's removal. And literally, they, they have a garrison there of 1,000 people, and 470 of them sneak Paul out of the city. Even those who don't know it, are instruments in God's hand to protect Paul and to keep the promise that Paul would preach the gospel in Rome. But one final thing. Paul, because of God's providence, Paul was going to Rome. He, Rome paid the ticket. He was going to pay his own way. But Rome paid the ticket. But he would never have spoken to the power brokers if he does it on his own. Because he goes this way, he speaks to people he would have never spoken to. One commentator said this, It's ironic that Roman justice will bring him there as a prisoner so that Paul will arrive safely and immediately be speaking to the highest levels of Roman society. It is unlikely that if Paul had journeyed as part of a missionary outreach to Rome on his own, such a high-level audience would be possible. It's one of the mysteries of God and His providence that many times... We cannot see why things are happening as they are. Yet God is surely at work in ways we could not have planned for ourselves. You ever think, I'm kicking against God's providence that he has put in my path and it would be the very thing I prayed for if I knew what he knew. Or let me put it another way. Can you trust him and hang on when the cross is heavy and you can't see? Because we've only got this small perspective. God's at 30,000 feet. We're at, we're at ground level. We do this with children all the time. They think we're mean. Your children think you're trying to run their life and you hate them because they can't eat all the chocolate. They can't do this. They have a small horizon. And they know they need you. Do you think maybe when you're in the crucible, 
you might look at it like that and say, I'm just a child. What could I know? But God is good. He's trustworthy. Maybe he's taken me places. I don't know how many times I've connected the dots to where I am in my own life. And there were ne- it's always been experiences I never thought were redeemable. They were hard and they were scary and painful. And God had to be asleep. Do you trust him? Okay. The final argument. Look no further than right here. We're going to go to this table because, because see, Jesus trusted God even in death so that us, we're in, when we face our little deaths, we can trust him too. Let's bow our heads and hearts as we come to this table. We're going to pray this prayer of confession. individually and then corporately, but we'll pray this together in just a moment. So let's bow our heads and pray now. And now together as God's people, almighty and most merciful Father, We are thankful that your mercy is higher than the heavens, wider than our wanderings, deeper than our sin. Forgive our careless attitudes toward your purposes, our refusal to relieve the suffering of others, our envy of those who have more than we have, our obsession with creating a life of constant pleasure, our indifference to the treasures of heaven our neglect of your wise and gracious law. Help us to change our way of life so that we may desire what is good, love what you love, and do what you command. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. This is why Jesus came. Just not that good. But his mercy is. Hear the words of pardon. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. So the Father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Amen. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and after he given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples. He said, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. I'm going to give my life for yours. You tried to get me to go away from this, but to, 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 to keep me from this path would give you a temporal relief from an oppressive power, not eternal relief from the burden of sin. In the same manner, after supper, he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for the remission of your sins. Drink this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show forth my death until I come. You're testifying that God is with us in the hard, hard places. Let's pray. Father, this is food for the journey. Relief for starving people. Feed us. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. We're going to come forward because we come to Jesus. In a Baptist church, I'd walk the aisle about every other time to be resaved or dedicated or whatever. And then I realized we need to walk the aisle every week, okay, to come to Jesus. And that's what we do. We're coming to Jesus who is feeding us. And so the bread's all gluten-free. There's wine and grape juice here. This is for all baptized believers of God's body. Your children who haven't made professions aren't quite ready. And if you don't profess them, you're not ready. But do come. Bring your children. We'll bless them. If you don't know Jesus, come and say, tell me more. I'd love to hear more about that. So let's come to Jesus. Let's keep the feast together.
Scripture says that when they had feasted together, uh, then they went out, they sang a hymn and departed. So let's conclude our worship as we sing now. On Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye where my possess my possessions lie all over those wide extended plains shines one eternal day there God the sun forever reigns and the sky is night of for the promised land. In the meantime, we are people on mission. Uh, but people on mission get broken, and we have people at the front would love to pray for you if you'd like. Uh, and if you want to know more about our church, how to be on mission here with us together, uh, in the narthex on the right, Josh is back there. I'd love to talk to you. Now receive benediction. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Hallelujah. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen.